Support for this episode of Plant Strong is brought to you by Nutramilk. Our little family of five has been using Nutramilk for three months, and I can tell you it's the fastest, easiest, and most economical way to make your own plant-based milks on the planet. We were easily spending over $150 a month on store-bought plant milks, but with Nutramilk, you simply throw in your walnuts, almonds, cashews, oats, or whatever milk you're in the mood for. Our personal favorite is oat milk with a few dates and some vanilla extract, and this machine muscles it into milk like nobody's business, and no strainer or any other step is necessary. In literally two minutes, you've got milk for your cereal, pancakes, waffles, or even recipes like mashed potatoes. In addition to making plant-based milks, the Nutramilk can make nut butters, sauces, dips, veggie stocks, spreads, smoothies, you name it, lickety split. I cannot recommend it enough. Visit the nutramilk.com and type in the code PLANTSTRONG to receive a $50 discount and free shipping. This is a diet uh, of death as far as I can see, mm -hmm. as far as the diseases it's going to spawn. Well, and it's not only a diet of death, it's a diet where you're eating death. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, it kills the animal, it kills the people who eat it, and it's going to kill this planet, too. Uh, I mean, there, there's, if they think that this paleo diet is the best diet and everybody should be eating paleo, they're talking about a flesh-based meal three times a day for eight billion people on this planet. It's going to destroy the entire ecosystem. It's, it's a totally arrogant, unsustainable, elitist type of, of approach to, uh, to nutrition that has no basis either in scientific fact or, or in medical common sense. I'm Rip Esselstyn, the founder of Engine 2, and I want to help Joe, our Bronx firefighter. I want to give him the support, the information, and the motivation that he needs to make the decisions that are going to save his life, and I want to give them to you too. Welcome to Plant Strong. There's no question about it. There are two diets out there that are getting a lot of attention right now, the paleo diet and the keto diet. They're basically kissing cousins and essentially they both seek to pull out the carbohydrates from your diet and increase the amount of meat that you're consuming, which is equated with protein, which somewhere along the line got equated with strength and health. Now, there are two big problems that come with this. One, our bodies are designed to burn carbohydrates for energy. And study after study prove that high fat diets promote chronic Western diseases in spades. And that's exactly what both of these diets are. And two, these diets are both sorely deficient in fiber, which is not doing you any favors when it comes to your health, your bowel movement function, or your microbiome. Now, people lose weight on these diets, but the truth is there are a lot of unhealthy ways to simply lose weight. Even at a common sense level, having a diet that consists largely of meat and ribs and bacon and eggs I mean, come on. But as always, I'm gonna do more than appeal to your common sense. Let's dig into the science. So for the next two episodes, we're gonna focus on the paleo diet and the keto diet. I brought in two experts to talk about what happens in our bodies when we eat this way, to dispel the lies surrounding these diets and to further demonstrate the power of a plant-strong way of eating. Let's get after it. So I'm here with Dr. Michael Clapper. He's one of the, the patriarchs of the plant-based movement. Michael has been, I think, deep in the weeds for a good 40-plus years. You, you must be stunned and amazed about where we are now in 2019 from where you started. Oh, it's exciting to see. After all those years at the coalface there, the wheels are starting to turn. And uh, it's, it's really gratifying to see the awareness that's sprouting up everywhere, the importance of plant-based nutrition. Yeah. I mean, from my vantage point I don't know really too many other people that have been in this as long as you yeah I mean you got McDougal and 
And my, but my father started in like 84. When, do you know what year it was that you started? I read John Robbins' book in 1986, okay. and that, that woke me up big time. Yeah. So it's been over 30 years. It's been over, well over 30 years, right. yes. Right, Going on I mean, 40. amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I like to refer to you as the Gandalf <laughs> of, uh, of the plant-based movement, and uh, to me, that's a huge compliment. Thank you, and, I appreciate that. And I hope that. you take it as such. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so what I'd love to talk to you today about, and I'd love to have you on the podcast numerous times, but today... What I'd love to talk about is the paleo keto um, diet that's out there that just seems to be picking up traction everywhere you look. And, you know, I'm working with this Bronx firefighter Mm -hmm. named Joe Inga, who's trying to turn his health around. And it just so happens that, you know, a lot of the guys at the firehouse are following the paleo keto program. And it goes far beyond, you know, the firehouse Mm -hmm. with all these men. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's out in America. It is. Big and wide. Um, so first question for you is why do you think this paleo keto keeps rising and has so much traction? Oh, because people like to taste a steak in their mouth and now they've got a rationalization for, oh, it's what the caveman ate and that's going to make me big and strong like a caveman. So pass the beef, pass the ribs. And it gives them a rationale for eating all this animal flesh and they think they have a good reason for it. So it's, it's really kind of, uh, just a, a brilliant marketing campaign. It really is uh, on a number of levels. I mean, there's no real precedent for this in history. Uh, When you look at the fossil record, when you look at the, uh, I mean, let's take a step back. The, yeah. you know, the image is that every Neanderthal had a mastodon in the freezer and spent all day eating mammoth meat because I'm a caveman and that's what I do. I eat mammoth meat. Uh, but the reality is when you look at the fossilized fecal droppings, um, they're, they're called coproliths. And uh, when you uh, see what these people really ate, you see the massive amounts of fiber in, in the diet. And these people are 100, 150 grams of fiber. Most days, uh, most Americans eat about 20 grams, maybe. And you and uh, when you do the uh, caloric analysis, turns out the majority of calories that were brought into the Paleolithic camp was not mammoth meat or any type of animal flesh. Most of the calories were gathered by the women who spent all day foraging for roots and tubers. And and we wanted, these are starchy uh, roots that we were eating. Then we were starchivores back then. We are starchivores now. And it was the plant starches that really provided the calories. It's not the animal flesh, but guys like to taste at stake, and so they'll they'll cling to this image, mm-hmm. but it has no factual basis in historic uh, yeah. truth. Yeah, I know that uh, you have a whole lecture uh, that that talks about kind of the pitfalls mm-hmm. of of the paleo program. Mm-hmm. Um, can we can we talk about some of those things? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talked to me about that being a, the patriarch of, of yeah. the movement, but uh, I'm a physician. And uh, that's my greatest concern. Um, These folks, and they're mostly young, uh, who are pushing this. And when you're 25, you know, nothing seems to uh, uh, pose any threat to you. But the reality is that my fear as a doctor is that people who are following this diet, who are packing their colon full of meat three times a day, who are running all this saturated fat through their arteries, are setting themselves up for an epidemic of colon cancer, clogged arteries, heart attacks, strokes. The bacteria that a meat-based diet spawns uh, turns carnitine into this molecule called trimethylamine oxide, which damages the arteries. Um, the meat, all meat comes from the slaughterhouse, so there's a there's a covering of, of gut bacteria from the animals on the surface of every steak. And when this is... Uh, when those the bac- endotoxins? Is that what that's called? Uh, endotoxin. Yeah. When these bacteria die, their cell walls break up and form this endotoxin stuff, nasty stuff that sets off blood coagulation uh, and histamine release. And very importantly, it makes your gut leaky. And so food proteins start flowing out into the bloodstream and flowing through joints, setting off arthritis and autoimmune diseases. And the bacteria that the meat-based diet spawns is very irritating to the gut wall itself. And that opens the door to ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. 
uh, this is a diet uh, of death as far as I can see, mm-hmm. as far as the disease is going to spawn. Well, and, it's not only a diet of death, it's a diet where you're eating death. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, it kills the animal, it kills the people who eat it, and it's going to kill this planet, too. Uh, I mean, there, there's if they think that this paleo diet is the best diet and everybody should be eating paleo, mm-hmm. they're talking about a flesh-based meal three times a day for eight billion people on yeah. this planet. It's going to destroy the entire ecosystem. It's, it's a totally arrogant, unsustainable, elitist type of, of approach to, uh, to nutrition that has no basis either in scientific fact or, or in medical common sense. The, 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 these folks are, are going to wind up. Uh, I've already seen my first case of colon cancer in a paleo woman. Uh, and Do you know how long she's been eating paleo? About about three years, mm-hmm. and uh, maybe she had it earlier, but uh, you know the, she may have had it, had it, uh, the seeds yeah. of it going. But certainly, this yeah. diet will fan the flames of malignant and, growth. And I've met a lot of people in the last. It just seems like the last six months that have told me they have an aunt, an uncle, a mother, a father that have either died or have been diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Can you explain for people what causes colon cancer and how can eating a whole food plant-based diet help prevent of that? Of course. Uh, well, nobody eats raw meat. And so you've got to grill that steak. You've got to grill that burger. And the very act of cooking animal muscle inevitably produces a whole array of cancer-causing carcinogenic hydrocarbons on the surface of the meat that gets mixed in with, with, the, with the ball of... Um, of fecal material that that meat becomes. And as the fecal mass gets down to the colon, the colon, by its very nature and design, holds the fecal material in there for a good day or so till the water can get absorbed out of it, what colons do. And during that time, you've got this mass of carcinogens rubbing on the colon wall. And due to the shape of the colon, it winds up in the same spot all the time. Every fecal mass winds up in the same. So it's almost like causing a blister of sorts? Yes, or, in a way. Or, or a callus? Like Okay, yeah, or a, a, like scraping, uh, scraping your knee, and okay. uh, it's a raw area there, but you do this month after month, year after year, and you keep angering those cells with carcinogens, they'll, they'll respond by spouting out a, a cancer. And, is that, and, and so is the first sign then a polyp? A polyp will begin, yes, and the uh, and the doctor who does a colonoscopy can see what the guy's been eating because all the polyps in there. But it just takes one polyp because they most of them will go malignant eventually, mm-hmm. and that's a, that's a red flag that your colon is waving. You know, they're not supposed to develop. Mm-hmm. Rice and beans and greens don't cause polyps to sprout out of your colon. This is an artifact of an irritative, flesh-based diet, mm-hmm. and so we're certainly going to see far more colon cancer from this. And once the colon get, gets um, starts uh, undergoing malignant change, again, they, they know not what they do in that when you eat a piece of meat, all the amino acids that make up that, that animal muscle protein flood into the liver, and the liver responds. Uh, like Dr. Greger says, it's like giving an eight-year-old boy a, a box of Tinker Toy parts. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to build something with it. And, and the body responds the same way. You flood the amino, the, the, all these amino acids into the liver, the liver responds. And it responds by putting out this hormone called insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1. Mm. This is the most powerful growth-promoting hormone in the body. And if you've got a little colon cancer just starting to sprout right. down in your intestine, and there's all this IGF-1 coursing through your bloodstream, that's going to, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. So it's that, like fertilizing it. Absolutely. And that cancer is going to grow. So it's safe explain, to, explain to me again, the IGF-1, mm-hmm. so growth factor number one, mm-hmm. uh, is, is it is it in the meat? How is How is it? No, the liver produces it. The liver it. produces it yes, as a reaction. To all the amino acids. To the amino acids. Right. Uh, these so are the, building blocks. The liver says, hmm, let's build something with it. And it's a wonderful mechanism when you're a growing right. child. Right. You know, that's fine. But if you're an adult guy with yeah. an early colon cancer, that's yeah. the last thing so you So it's a want. reaction to the animal protein? Yes, absolutely. High-protein diets spawn high GF1 levels. Wow. And, yeah. and you don't want that as an adult because you start spawning growth in places you don't want it. Yeah. The woman who's got a little breast cancer growing in her breast, and she's eating this paleo diet. She's going to find that little cancer gets to be a big cancer pretty quick. Mm. This is a, it's a scary thing to do just for that taste of steak in your mouth for a few seconds. They don't realize what happens downstream from that. Yeah. You know, another thing, uh, I find that the paleo people, they're fans of saturated fat. I mean, it seems to me like the, the, the preponderance of the scientific research is very clear that saturated fat 
does what? Oh, it, mm-hmm. it, it causes great damage in the body in a couple of ways. This, and it's not necessary. It's not necessary. Uh, and uh, this study came out, which was a very distorted study um, a couple of years ago, that showed that saturated fats weren't that harmful uh, when compared to white flour and white sugar, etc. So uh, along comes the Time magazine cover, butter is back and saturated fat is good. And they took this and ran with it. There was certainly no scientific evidence really supporting this. And the evidence is very clear. The saturated fats, uh, one, they, they injure the artery walls. Second, they, uh, in, they inhibit the liver's ability to excrete cholesterol into the bile, and so cholesterol starts piling up in the bloodstream, and that leads to artery clogging. And finally, saturated fats are pro-inflammatory. They fan inflammatory reactions throughout the body, and now we're seeing so many diseases uh, from, well, artery disease to autoimmune diseases, arthritis, have an element of inflammation going, and uh, the saturated fats are part of those pro-inflammatory molecules. And then what what about type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance? Oh, absolutely. Contributes to that, right? This is one of the, the most bankrupt infuriating aspects of the paleo philosophy from the doctor's point of view. There's no question that fats uh, make, they clog up your insulin receptors is one way to look at it. They make you insulin resistant. And uh, and all these folks who are eating all this fat, fat, fat are making themselves insulin resistant. But because the amount of sugar that they're eating, oh, we don't want to eat those carbs, even though we're carbohydrate-burning creatures, um, because they eat so little sugars, they see their blood sugar go down. And they say, see, it's a great diet. Keep your blood sugar low. Keep your insulin low. And then if they eat a little, some carbohydrates, eat a potato, now, oh, the blood sugar goes way up because their insulin receptors are clogged up. But they use that to say, aha, so you know, those carbs are bad, you know, you shouldn't be eating that, when really they've made themselves basically pre-diabetic, and of course they can't handle yeah. sugars now. Yeah. But this is not normal physiology. This is not healthy in any way, shape, or form. And it's delusional, like, uh, like Dr. McDougall says, people love to hear good news about bad habits, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that's what this is all about. Well, in episode two... Uh, no, episode three of the podcast, I interviewed Dean and uh, Aisha Shurzai, mm-hmm. and they talk about how, you know, saturated fat is really, really awful for uh, brain health, Absolutely. dementia, Alzheimer's, and, sure. and all those things. Sure, sites, right? and, and these, you know, these young guys pushing this paleo diet, you know, they're 25, they're 30, but man, you see them when they're 50, they're, they're going to be putting their car keys in the refrigerator. And mm-hmm. uh, how did this happen? How did this happen? Well... It, it, garbage in, garbage in. And these guys, and the paleo people, they also seem to think that you can have all these egg yolks. You can have all this cholesterol, and that the cholesterol, it's like a, a, somehow a different type of cholesterol. What do you say to that? The cholesterol is not a healthy fuel for the human body. We, have, we make all that we need. Uh, when you eat other animals' cholesterol, it starts piling up in the bloodstream, and it, and it certainly is harmful. And uh, again, this is a massive self-delusion here. The, the, there's, there's no way that this is going to turn out to be a healthy diet. And when those, when, uh, you know, I'll put a $100 bill on the table that the articles are going to start showing up in the medical journals mm-hmm. in, in the next, I don't know, two years, five years. Paleo diet associated with colon cancer. Paleo diet associated with autoimmune disease. Paleo diet associated with dementia. And my left eyebrow won't go up this much. Uh, yep, I, I'm about time, right on time, these articles is gonna, they're going to show. And, and these folks are going to be the sorriest folks in town. Um, and the folks who promoted this, who pushed it, um, they're, they're going to have to answer for misguiding the public so severely. Like they set themselves up as nutritional experts. And uh, I read a book once uh, from, by Lauren Cordain that we should be eating lots of meat. Uh, and they know not wherewith they speak. And they're causing a lot of damage. The uh, and, and I tell my colleagues, my medical colleagues, you know, do no harm includes dietary advice mm-hmm. as well. And you can really cause a lot of harm by misdirecting your patients as far as what a healthy human diet really is. Mm-hmm. We are not carnivorous apes. We have the same digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have, and they're up in the trees eating fruit and leaves. And basically, we should have the same herbivorous fuel as well. well you just mentioned doctors and uh you know, one of the things that I find absolutely infuriating, and I can't imagine you because you are a doctor, but when I, 
uh, I'm out um, giving talks, and I have people come up to me and say that their expert cardiologist advised them to go on the paleo keto program, and it's like, oh my gosh, these cardiologists are they not up on the peer-reviewed you know research? Oh and as Dr. Kim Williams says. What, there's two different types of, of cardiologists? cardiologists. Those, do, you, do you want to say yeah, that? a classic. Uh, yeah. There's only two types of cardiologists. There are vegan cardiologists and those who haven't read the medical literature yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's no question. A whole food, plant-based diet is by far the healthiest for our arteries and our heart. And, and I hope those cardiologists who are pushing a paleo diet, I hope they've got good malpractice insurance mm -hmm. because there, it's just a matter of time before an angry widow walks in their door Say my husband dropped dead, uh, or my husband died on a on the operating table last week during a four vessel coronary artery bypass last week, and and I just read that this was a totally avoidable death, and they're, 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 I hope they've got good lawyers and good insurance because this is bad advice they're handing out. Can let's let's talk for a sec about some of the the bad substances that are in. Meat, whether mm -hmm. it's red meat, chicken, sure. fish, eggs, sure. you know, kind of all these animal products that are so popular in the mm -hmm. in, in the paleo keto keto programs, and I think you've already mentioned mm -hmm. animal protein. Yep. Um, we talked about cholesterol. Yep. We talked about saturated fat. Yep. What else do you want to add to the list? You you said TMAO. Indeed, yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. These animals are confined in these feedlots where they are fed bushels of grains every day. And these grains are heavily sprayed with herbicides and pesticides and growth promoters. And the animals are fed antibiotics. The, the, and these are fat-soluble molecules that wind mm -hmm. up in the and the animal's flesh, and you run into this phenomenon of bioconcentration. And, uh, and week after week, that poor cow or that poor steer is, is eating all these sprayed corn and soybeans. And these pesticides and herbicides are, are concentrating in their, in, their, in their muscles and in their fat. And every time you bite into that burger or you chew on that chicken leg, you're getting the, the bioconcentrated herbicides and pesticides. They feed these animals antibiotics, lincomycin and erythromycin and tetracycline, that, that winds up on your dinner plate as well. And the water that they give these animals to drink is not pure water. It's contaminated with heavy, heavy metals, heavy metals lead, cadmium, arsenic, mercury. That winds up in the animal's muscle. It's a foul piece of flesh that, mm -hmm. that is being sold to the public as, oh, our Paleolithic ancestors ate this. Well, no, they didn't. Mm -hmm. And meat was a rarity in, in their diet, by and large. If they, you know, you got this image of you know, people feasting on the, on the mammoth carcass. But the truth is, if they, uh, most hunts were unsuccessful. Most times the guys came back empty-handed. Nine out of ten times the hunts were unsuccessful. And if you had a starving infant at home, uh, they're, 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 you're going to starve to death if it weren't for the, for the starchy gruels that the uh, women were making up uh, to keep us all alive. And if they did manage to snag a, uh, uh, some animal and drag the carcass back into camp, there was no refrigeration. It rotted within days, and it became... A, a, a dangerous substance to eat, and uh, the the idea that this was uh, you know the the best food that we could be eating certainly today's version of meat uh, is is far from healthy. That's for sure. If you're having a hard time starting or staying the course with a plant strong lifestyle, and you really want to master the habits and create a sustainable system around your personal healthy eating. I invite you to check out our Plant Strong Meal Planner. I am really pumped up on this platform. It was specifically designed and engineered to solve one very common hurdle we have heard from each and every one of you. How do you make plant-based eating easy, convenient, and delicious? We came up with the solution. We have thousands of Plant Strong recipes customized to your personal preferences, integrated grocery delivery to most major metropolitan areas, the ability to create and edit shopping lists, and a team of Engine 2 coaches who are on hand to answer every question from how do you cut a mango in half to how do I begin cooking this way? No matter how silly the question, we are on hand to help. And all of this is available for a buck 90 a week when you sign up for a year. We get emails from people every day saying, 
how this has changed their life and it's made going plant-based so much easier. I hope you'll let us help you and your family fall in love with this way of eating. To learn more, sign up at mealplanner.engine2.com or click on the meal planner on our website, engine2.com. Let me just throw out some other things and if and if you feel like talking about it, great. And if not, we'll just keep moving on. What about hem iron or heme iron? Heme iron. That's another one. So people think, you know, they've got this image that, oh, iron makes for hemoglobin, makes for big muscles, and yay, that's a, it's a good thing. Well, it's not, it turns out. Um, there's two kinds of iron uh, in, in the diet. Uh, the heme iron is, comes from animals, and it's in the center of the hemoglobin molecule in the blood of the animal. You're eating the animal's blood. Uh, and... Uh, then there's non-heme iron that's found in plants, and spinach and green vegetables have um, have iron. So what's the difference? Well, without getting too much uh, into the biochemistry, the problem is that too much iron is not healthy. Iron is an oxidizing agent. You see that on your car bumper. Iron will oxidize, and you don't want iron overload in your body. Mm. Well, um, heme iron comes into the bloodstream and into the body without any throttle placed on it uh, by the intestine. The intestine just lets all the heme iron in that you eat. Well, it starts uh, accumulating in the walls of the arteries, uh, in the bone marrow, and oxidative damage starts happening, and this, this injures the artery walls, and one of those things that contributes to artery damage. Non-heme iron in plants, the body's very selective. It, it has the ability to decide how much of that stuff it wants to let into the body, and, and so heme, non-heme iron from plants is the safer type of iron. So it can actually regulate it. Absolutely. Uh-huh. But the folks who are eating all this meat, uh, they're facing iron overload us guys we can't get rid of iron and and if you're a postmenopausal female she can't get rid of the iron either and we're talking about adult human beings here and so these folks are giving themselves iron overload with all this meat 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 and that's going to bite what's that called um, when you have the iron load, is it called hemo? hemo well, hemosiderosis. Okay. Um, the, uh, yeah, the hemochromatosis is a, is, a, is a disease of that. But okay. well, basically, uh, you know, that's a that's a genetic issue. Yeah. But just plain old iron overload is epidemic because we're eating all this meat, 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 and that is not healthy. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, we should get our iron from plants. We should get all our nutrients So that's contributing plants. to all the oxidative stress load. It certainly is a major contributor to it, sure. It. What about uh, new 5GC? Oh, that's uh, interesting. So this is a, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if we're running up the, the, the laundry list of the reasons why you shouldn't be eating meat, uh, there is this substance, it's a sialic acid called NU5GC. Uh, only animals make uh, this substance. Uh, plants don't make it. But this stuff is very pro-inflammatory. It sets off inflammatory reactions throughout the body. If you stain for it, you can find NU5GC in the atherosclerotic plaques in your arteries. Uh, the folks with the rheumatoid arthritis, you can find new 5GC in their inflamed joints. Uh, it's, a, it's a real incendiary molecule, and our paleo friends are eating it three times a day and giving themselves jolts of um, this pro-inflammatory molecule. And then when they walk in the office, gee, Doc, I feel so achy. I don't know. I don't have the energy. Gee, my joints are swollen. Yeah, because doctors never ask, what are you eating? Um, they, uh, you know, they'll be given some ibuprofen, which makes their gut leakier. Uh, but again, this is not the natural diet of human beings. We are not mountain lions. We are herbivorous eating creatures. We weren't supposed to be eating new 5GC three times a day, and that's going to bite these paleo folks. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really an unfortunate yeah. situation. And the other thing you, you touched upon early on, but m- maybe we can revisit it, and that was the uh, heterocyclic amines, oh, yeah. the HCAs. Mm-hmm. Yes. And those are formed when? When you cook meat, any uh, meat, any meat, whether it's fish, whether you're grilling that salmon, or uh, barbecuing that chicken, or grilling that steak, you are creating these nasty polycyclic hydrocarbons, yeah. and they are carcinogenic. No question about it. 
So basically those char marks are like carcinogen yeah, marks? So that's exactly what they are. And when you think about the, you know, as soon as you eat it, uh, you know, you're smearing carcinogens around the back of your throat and slides down your esophagus into the stomach uh, and uh, then out the small intestine. But you wonder about the oral cancers we see, the esophageal cancers, the stomach cancers. Well, how much of this is from smearing uh, cooked animal muscle on your, on your tissues mm-hmm. two, three times a day? that are full of carcinogens. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we don't get away with anything. Another thing that uh, I know you talk about is the, the, the high level of methionine. Yes. That, 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 and what is methionine, and, right. and what does high levels of methionine lead right. to? Yeah. Methionine is an amino acid. All proteins have a little bit of methionine in it, but meat has a lot of methionine in it. And uh, in, when the body metabolizes methionine, it, it uh, takes off a methyl group, and that turns it into homocysteine molecules. And uh, this is not friendly stuff. This mm. stuff is very irritating to the artery walls, and it, it, along with the heme iron and uh, NU5GC, it's one of these pro-inflammatory molecules that inflames the walls of the arteries, and people who walk around with high homocysteine levels wind up with clogged arteries and heart attacks and strokes. And uh, again, another sign from our metabolism, we shouldn't be running a lot of animal flesh through our bloodstream. Uh, You don't want a bunch of homocysteine that comes from this methionine ingestion. Mm -hmm. So another reason, another red flag. It just seems like these these red flags are just popping up all over the place. Absolutely. And and the paleo guys put on their (laughs) blinders and, oh, well, my caveman ate it. Well, yeah, the caveman died at age 30 or so. (laughs) That's the point. I don't want their lifespan. Thank you. And you also, I know that, you know, I've heard a lot about how hard um, eating a paleo keto type of diet is on the bones. Mm, Yeah. Can you address that? Well, sure. Um, These are very acid promoting diets. Meats uh, turn into uh, acids on various levels. uh, And uh, it's, it's an acid-forming diet. The, there's a lot of sulfur-containing amino acids, methionine being one of them, but cysteine, cysteine, homo, uh, 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 taurine. Uh, these are very abundant in animal flesh, and they all have a little atom of sulfur. And so you put sulfur in water, it turns into sulfuric acid, sulfurous acid. So this is a, this is a high acid-load diet, a flesh-based diet. Well, as uh, all this acid flows through your bones, um, your body's got to neutralize its acid acid somewhere, and it does it by by dissolving the bones, and the calcium and phosphorus that comes out neutralizes the bones, but mean, neutralizes the acid, but meanwhile, you've lost bone mass, right. and high-protein diets are are inextricably linked to uh, to low bone density, to osteoporosis. And, and 99% of our calcium stores are stored, stored in our bones. In our bones. So would it be fair to say that by, by eating this high-protein diet, by eating all these dairy products where the protein actually trumps your body's ability to store calcium that you're literally almost kind of peeing your bones away? Yeah, that's exactly. Well, good image, sir. Yes, uh, that's another bargain that these uh, paleo folks are making with the <laughs> devil here. Yeah, really. They're trading their, their skeletal health for it. Yeah. What, what about, uh, you hear a lot about people, at least I do, that get gout, kidney stones, is that also related to eating too much meat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, gout is... Can you explain that? Sure, right. <laughs> Right. Um, gout is when crystals of this uh, molecule called uric acid start depositing out in your joint membranes. And a gouty joint, oh, it's painful to look at. It is so red and swollen. It, you, it feels hot when you put your hand over it. It's a fire burning in your joint from these very irritating uric acid crystals. Well, where does uric acid come from? It's the breakdown product of DNA. Uh, the chromosome uh, molecule there. Well, when you are eating a piece of animal muscle, you're eating a huge load of, of that cow's DNA. And your body can only process it so far until it starts generating lots of uric acid. Mm. And so the high meat eaters, uh, they've got this big uric acid load to deal with. And in, and if they're not good excretors of that uric acid, if it doesn't go out in the urine, uh, then it builds up in the joints and they get clinical gout. But even if they are able to excrete it through the urine, 
uh, if they're not drinking enough water and their urine gets all concentrated, that uric acid will precipitate out as crystals and that form these hellacious uric acid kidney stones that have little spikes coming out of them. They're fearsome looking stones under the microscope. Uh, and it's just a hellaciously painful episode that puts you on the operating table while the urologist tries to fish that stone out or has to cut you open to get it out because they don't pass easily. Uh, so uric acid is not something that you want to uh, have in large amounts, and the meat eaters are generating lots of uric acid from all that DNA they're eating in the meat. Another reason to, to stay Another weak. one, exactly. Yeah, I mean, really. uh, and then, and then what, so we talked about some of the substances that meat have mm-hmm. that uh, are not beneficial that we want to stay away from. Mm-hmm. What are some of the, the, the substances that meat don't have that whole plant-based foods have that, that make them a, a weak food source? Yeah, sure. We have this gloriously long intestinal tract that thrives on a high-fiber diet, a a diet that has lots of plant fiber, and it creates these big, soft, easy-to-pass stools that that glide through the intestinal tract, don't require a lot of pressure to build up. Uh, and, And the fiber... Uh, the colon bacteria will turn that into butyric acid and, and beneficial uh, molecules that, that nourish the colon wall. Well, meat has no fiber in it uh, at all, and it turns into these hard little balls of stool that the colon can't get a purchase on to, to push along. So the colon has to squeeze really hard, um, and that raises the air pressure in the colon. And if there's any weak spots in the colon wall, those mm. little weak spots will herniate out, and you get these diverticuli pouches popping out all over that get infected and then you get diverticulitis and that'll put you on the operating table or at least um, by the course of antibiotics um, to push these hard constipated stools out uh, the, the veins around the rectum wind up bulging and becoming varicose, and you get these nasty uh, uh, hemorrhoids we are not meant to eat a fiber deficient diet and it, and, and what is it i think the latest stats that i've read are that 97 percent of america is deficient in fiber? Yeah, absolutely. You know, people, you know, when they hear that uh, people are uh, plant eaters, they say, well, you're going to eat your protein. Protein is not an issue. Everything, all plant foods have protein, and, and beans and greens are, are full of protein. The real issue is where are you going to get your fiber? Yeah. And and meat and dairy products uh, have none of that to offer. No, and to no. base your diet around a flesh-based diet is buying yeah. yourself a fiber-deficient yeah. diet that's uh, going to bite you. And the other thing, that meat doesn't have that the paleo people actually tout mm-hmm. as being good mm-hmm. are carbohydrates. <laughs> so, I mean, can you speak to that? Which, oh, which, which, which is, is it's kind of ludicrous, but, but tell me if, but they find a little bit of a shred of truth. Uh-huh, sure. and, and you and I both know that 90% of America's carbohydrate consumption mm-hmm. is coming from refined carbs mm-hmm. that are bad. Yes, absolutely. Trashy. They're right. So they're good there. I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're right there. They're right there. Mm-hmm. But so th- I think that they, they use that as kind of their argument that, oh, you know, we don't want to, you don't want to eat carbs. You want to mm-hmm. eat meat that doesn't have any carbs. Right. But so it's got weak protein. It's got weak fat and no carbs. So what, what, what is it with the carbs? Oh, it, it's... And it also is another example of how shoddy the science behind this, uh, how they pervert the science here. Um, there's no getting away from it. We are carbohydrate-burning organisms. The Krebs cycle enzymes in your mitochondria burn glucose. We are sugar-burning organisms. Fat is an emergency fuel. When, when there, there were no berries on the, on the, on the bush there uh, during our foraging days, we had to dip into our own fat stores. Uh, and... And you can get by for X number of days on that, but that is not our daily fuel. Our daily fuel is carbohydrates. Now, the problem is the conflation that you just mentioned. The paleo folks are right. The Oreo cookies and and granola bars and Twinkies, oh, those are full of carbs. Well, yeah, those are refined sugars. But it's it's really fallacious and a bit scurrilous to take the big broad brush of carbohydrates and tar Uh, not only the Oreo cookies, but include apples and bananas and kale. And these are all high-carbohydrate foods. Mm -hmm. All plant foods are high in carbohydrates, but that's what stems and leaves and roots are made of. But that's what we're meant to run on. And for them to say, oh, carbohydrates are are all bad, uh, and, and to 
then, as I said, conflate the, the good carbohydrates that come from whole plant foods and from beans and greens and fruits and vegetables to, to equate those with the same refined, poisonous, simple sugars that are, that are in uh, the high fructose corn syrup and soft drinks and all that. And so call them all carbs and assume they all have the same bad effect in the body. That's scientifically scurrilous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's outrageous. Well, it's egregious, that they do isn't that. it? Yeah, pardon me? It's egregious. It's egregious, absolutely. And it's yeah. dishonest. Yeah. And, and it's sloppy science. It's not even science. It's propaganda. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So people un- unwittingly, mm-hmm. they are, are, are doing the paleo keto and they're depriving themselves of... The very fiber and the very uh, high, good carbohydrates our body really requires. To, absolutely. To, to be supremely healthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look at all the plant-based athletes. You see all the yeah. rippling muscle and all these fabulous athletic feces these guys do on plant-based diets to, uh, to, yeah. to negate that in any way. It's and, just outrageous. Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, to take it a, a step farther, mm-hmm. you've got these books that are being written about, you know, grain brain and how grains, uh, are, uh, uh, grains and bread are just so absolutely awful. Um, they talk about, you know, uh, I mean, they're bashing beans and, and, oh. and, and grains because of lectins and lignans. Yeah. Uh, do you know anything about oh, that stuff? Yeah, and people, these docs like to sell books, so they make these outrageous claims. And it's really disheartening to see my profession prostituting itself through these guys um, who uh, oh, don't, eat, uh, don't eat beans, they have lectins. Well... The people have been eating beans for you know, thousands of years. And when you look at the blue zone diets yeah. around the world, people who live to be over 100, they all eat like They all eat beans. So if lectins on beans were that toxic, uh, none of these people would make well, it to and, 100. And, and once you heat them up, the lectins, the lectins are, are gone. gone. They, they, yeah. you know, they all disappear. Who and eats their you, beans raw? Nobody's eating raw beans. Right. And as you, as you cook the beans, yeah. the lectins disappear. And yeah. again, they're, ju- they're just spawning fear. I think everyone will agree that Dr. Clapper knows the body and how it's supposed to work. Today, he has systematically dismantled any pillar the paleo diet is trying to build upon. It is, as he says, all propaganda. But one thing I want to mention that we shouldn't brush over, there's a keto phenomenon. Oh, that's that's even worse. Next week, we'll talk more with Dr. Clapper about the keto diet from his perspective as a physician. And then we'll take a deep dive with my friend, Dr. Doug Lyle. He'll share his view on the keto diet as an evolutionary psychologist. And spoiler alert, it ain't pretty. Doug will laser in on why ketosis is no shortcut to health. Instead, it's overriding our body's divinely designed system. And like any beautiful machine, it will break down and overheat on a dirty ketogenic fuel source. Let's fillet the notion that paleo or keto are good ideas because they aren't. I want to thank my co-creator of the podcast, Scott Battisil and 10% Media, Lori Kordowich, producer extraordinaire and the Engine 2 director of events, Bumble Media for this podcast production, and Brandon Curtis for everything in between. Thanks to Whole Foods Market for believing in me and giving me a platform for the last 10 years. Special thanks to Joe Inga, our Bronx firefighter, for your courage to not only change your life, but also allowing us to share your story along the way. And lastly, I wanna thank my father and mother, Dr. Cobble B. Esselstyn Jr. and Diane Cryle Esselstyn as well as all the Plant Strong pioneers who have been pushing this boulder uphill for more than three decades. As they say, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And remember, if you're digging the show, please rate us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And with that, let me say, peace, Engine 2, keep it Plant Strong.